Okay. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name's Bill Manning from Northwest Local Land Services at Gunnedah. This is the uh, Cover Crops webinar. Just a few reminders, we will be recording the session today and there will be um, an opportunity to ask questions towards the end of the webinar. Uh, you can just type them into the chat section down at the bottom of your little menu bar there. And at the end, you will be getting a survey after I end the webinar. And we'd ask that please, if you could take a few minutes to fill that out because it helps us get funding to do these type of things. Our presenter today is Andrew Erbacker. He's a research agronomist with staff in Queensland, has done trial work on cover crops. So um, without any further ado, I'll hand over to Andrew and he'll take you through the presentation. Andrew, you should be on air now. Thanks, Bill. And is my screen up? I can see it. Yep. Yep. Cool. So I've got creative today and asked the question, are cover crops robbing water or are they robbing hood? And as always, the disclosure, there's a list of logos along the bottom and they're all the organisations that were involved in this project, um, funders and cooperators. So I guess we're a webinar, so it's a rhetorical question, but why do you want to grow cover crops in the first place? So these are a few of the reasons I've come up with. Uh, the people who started growing cover crops 15 years ago around Gundawindi, we're doing it for erosion control. There's a whole lot of feed in the system, um, keeping the biology happy, trying to build organic carbon. And then there's a the fallow efficiency um, benefits. So our work and what I'll talk about today is largely about the water and there's a bit about the erosion benefits. So I'm just going to take a quick jump back to a different project I work on. Um, so the farming systems project, uh, we've got long-term systems trials at a range of locations from Trangy up to Emerald, growing a heap of crops. And out of that, we've generated a heap of fallow efficiency data. And if you just look at the winter cereals versus the winter pulses, if you've got more stubble, you've got much better fallow efficiency. And then we break that up more. Short fallows are more efficient, long fallows are less efficient, but if you've got more stubble, you've got more fallow efficiency, so you're capturing more rainfall for use in the next crop. So I guess in that context, the concept, this is a, you know, a concept diagram of cover crops. We've got low cover and it's breaking down, so we're getting less over time. Um, with low cover, our soil water builds slowly. But can we use a bit of that soil water we've got to grow more ground cover? And then after we spray out our cover crop, we've got more ground cover, better fail efficiency. And at some point in the future, we'll have more water than if we had a left a bear. So that's the opportunity. Um, and part of that is just purely evaporation. So this is actually a photo from one of our trial sites taken three days after an inch of rain. So we've got good stubble cover in the foreground and you can see you still can't walk on that plot and the background is our bare control and it's bare and the surface is dried out. So that'll continue on for three to four weeks until either they've equalised and no more surface water is going to evaporate or we get more rain. If we get more rain before they equalise, then you're ahead. So we did a number of trials. This first one we'll talk about is actually where that photo was taken. Um, 
we're looking at spring cover crops in that rotation coming out of double skip sorghum going back around a week. So sorghum last summer, first chance in spring, we put in some cover crops. Um, having our cover crops, we actually saved a couple of fallow sprays while the cover crops were growing. We increased the soil water, um, or we stored more soil water and we'll go into the details of that in the later. And we increased our wheat yields a lot more than we expected. So this is how. So number one, we grew more ground cover. So at this site, we had a range of different type. We had millet terminated um, at first node, flag leaf or anthesis. So that's our early, mid and late. And then we had a range of other um, cover crop types that I'll talk about on the next slide. But I guess yeah, the first photo here is what the cover crops, the ground cover looked like at termination, and we didn't actually get much more ground cover between the early and our late termination. The second photo you can see there is what it looked like when we planted the next crop. So growing the cover crop longer allowed the stubble to be a bit more resilient and hang, hang around a bit longer. So I guess the, there's a few things going on here. So this is just a visual assessment of ground cover over time. Um, our multi-species cover crop grew cover the fastest and that was the tillage radish in it. It just flopped straight across the rows. Um, but you'll see the multi-species, the blue is the green line, the blue lines our lab lab and our pink dotted lines are early sprayed out, they, they decline quite rapidly after they were sprayed out. And that just comes back to the type of stubble we had, you know, soft leafy plants, high in nitrogen, the bugs got hold of them and said, yummy, gone. Um, we grew, when we grew our millets longer, we produced more cover. So we went from about 60% cover up to 90% cover in our late. Um, We've got an extra light there, which is actually a plot we were supposed to pray, spray out with the light and we missed it. Um, so it grew a lot of cover and a bit more stem in the cover and it just hung around a lot longer. So those, you know, our mid terminated millet, our sorghum, which was sprayed out on the same day as the mid terminated millet and our late terminated millets just hung around a bit longer and we we're you know that 50 to 80 percent ground cover still when we planted our wheat. Um, so I'm going to show a few of these graphs today and what it is is we had neutron probes in all of the plots and we're just plotting change in soil moisture over time. So we've just said every plot was zero on the day the trials we planted the cover crop um, our cover crops used water over the same period of time. We've got rainfall across the top here. We're getting rainfall and our bear control is accumulating water. So that gap's actually getting wider. Once we spray out, we, we see this period of dry cracked surface and we're getting very high efficiency for that rainfall event. So that that example there, we've accumulated 85 mils from 88 mils of rainfall. It's um, not always that stark, but it's always there. So if you come back to the left here, our mid termination, we've accumulated about 20 mils from 40 mils of rainfall. So there's that period of very high fall efficiency straight after you spray them out. And we, we get back a lot of the water we used in that one event. And then after that, we, we're getting that evaporation effect. So the, the cover treatments are just slowly sneaking ahead of the bare plots over time. Um, the final thing is the one we weren't budgeting on. And we established a better wheat crop. We grew a better wheat crop and that wheat crop was actually able to suck a bit harder and use more water out of the fallow. So we're, we're getting benefits on both ends of the wheat crop by having um, a better, stronger, healthier, wheat crop established. 
And this is what our wheat crop looked like. So where we had bare fallow, um, yeah, moisture was a bit marginal at planting and we've got gaps in the crop. Now lab lab cover broke down, but it was still better than bare. There's a few gaps in it, but a better crop. But where we had a good ground cover, we had a good even stand of wheat established. Um, so on the left there, we expected from, so what do we got here? The red dots here are the right hand axis and that's how much water we had compared to the control when we planted the wheat crop. So obviously the control is zero, lab labs a couple of mils behind, but our, our millet and sorghum cover crops that had more water um, than the control. And in those millet cover crops, we'd expect a fallow efficiency of 15 millimetres of grain per, uh, 15 kilograms of grain per millimetre of water, about two to 500 kilos of grain yield, which is about 20 to $120 a hectare more money in your pocket. The blue bars are our grain yield. And what we actually measured is um, our best cover crop, that late terminated millet, more even establishment plus more water gave us a tonne and a half of extra yield, which is, um, I think it more than paid for the cover crop. So part of that's the ex better establishment um, and it allowed that cover crop to extract a bit more water and it was just a better crop. Um, so we had another site was actually planted slightly before Bangania. It was millet cover crops between back to back, uh, sorry, barley cover crops between back to back cotton. Um, and in the photo there, we've actually got tillage radish on its own there as well. Again, bit of co crop competition during the fallow and we saved ourselves a fallow spray. Um, mixed soil water results um, in that some of them, we were quite a bit behind on soil water, but this was an overhead irrigated paddock and we increased our cotton yields across the board. So again, um, this is our change in soil water graph. You know, everything started at zero and the cover crops use soil water. Um, where we sprayed out our uh, barley early, we've started accumulating and we were, and even our mid, sorry, we were the same or better by the time we planted cotton. And you know, obviously a much shorter fallow period than the last trial. So our early terminated cover crop was still providing enough ground cover when we planted our cotton. Um, what's slightly different in this site is once the cotton was planted, they turned on the pivot. So most of those rainfall numbers after the cotton planted was irrigation. And we're getting that fallow efficiency period in crop. So wide rate cotton, there's still a lot of area that's bare or fallow. Um, so we're getting that better infiltration. And then again, we got to the end of the cotton and everything has extracted more water than where, than the bare um, fallow. So bit of a table summary. Um, so over that fallow period, so it was cotton, background to cotton, our bare control accumulated 50 mils of soil water. Um, our early um, terminated barley grew, got it 14 mils more than that. So what's that, 70 mils? Mid was about the same. And then we've got a whole heap of deficits there, including our um, barley that we took through to yield. We basically harvested it and they turned around and planted cotton the next day. And it was 100 mils behind. Now the caveat around this trial is the whole paddock was actually wheat that was harvested. So the irrigation schedule was set for that. But, you know, where the water that was put on has been used more efficiently um, where we've had cover crops by the cotton to produce an extra three bales. Um, 
So the next two sites, we've gone from dry years to very dry years. Um, 2018, we had a bit of rain in September, October. So we got our cover crops in and they didn't look too bad and then it didn't rain ever again. Um, at Jagerburn, we got them in nice and early. It was in fallowed out of double skip sorghum. Um, we actually recovered the water used by those cover crops. We had an improved opportunity to plant in 2019, but there was no yield differences and we'll we'll have a investigate that a little bit now. Um, so at Jagerman, we actually went all out and we had winter cover crops in 2018 and spring cover crops in 2018. The, the wheat cover crops, they were planted late, pretty low rainfall. There was what, one decent rainfall event while the cover crops were alive. Um, and they just they just didn't do much. It was a, a shitty wheat crop. You wouldn't have grown it as a wheat crop and it didn't provide a whole lot of cover. But we did get, in our late terminated wheat, we got enough to get above that 30% threshold and we were, bit better off than the wheat than the bare fallow you know by Christmas time. Again we had the spring cover crops they used what's that between so they were about 30 to 60 mils behind the control when they were sprayed out but that high fallow efficiency period straight after spray out and then we're building in on small rainfall events um, until we planted our wheat. Um, and yeah, you know, the that soil water benefit at harvest of the wheat crop wasn't really there because all of the crops were pretty shitty because it didn't rain. So we came to this site in May to plant our wheat and we went and had a bit of a scratch. Where we were bare, the moisture was down, you know, 20 centimetres on a box soil, and there's no way we were gonna get planted into that moisture. Um, where we had, you know, that 30 to 50% cover, you could have a scratch and a dig and you'd find a bit of moisture and you could probably put a seed on top of that moisture and probably get an okay establishment. Where we had a lot of ground cover, so our late terminated millets, um, yeah, we had, good moisture there you probably could have planted it in a what was a really hard season anyway we didn't think 2019 could be as dry as well so we'll give it another fortnight and see if we can get a storm over it and plant the site otherwise um didn't happen so we just dry planted it and we ran some trickle tape down the rows to get the weed up and we got ourselves a nice even plant establishment so half a tonne to the hectare of grain yield. I don't think anyone would be um, real excited about that. But for the year, that was probably one of the best yields in the district, I think. Um, yeah, so that irrigation got us that even plant establishment, unlike the Bungunya site we talked about before. So the difference was 100% water. Um, and there was no differences in soil water at planting. So there was no differences in grain yield between the treatments. Um, not a treatment effect, but what was quite interesting, so neutron probes, as you can see, are in the skip, but we're doing an EM reading beside the probe and over the old sorghum row. And double skip sorghum, it's drier under the row than in the skip. By the end of the fallow, it was wetter where we had that bit of sorghum stubble, regardless of what cover crop treatment we had, and drier in the skip. So that was just a bit interesting and that was more yield on that those treatments. Um, the final site we did was um, even drier again. So we actually went through and planted plots of chickpeas or wheat to try and get um, stubble differences. Uh, so that was in 2018. 
first opportunity in the fallow after that harvest, we planted some cover crops in our chickpea stubble. So, what's my next slide there? Um, so, 2000, so this is the end of 2018, 2019. So we got a dump of about 75 mils straight after we planted, um, after we harvested. So we got our cover crops in in mid-November. So a full same same season, but two months later, planting our cover crops than Jaeger burn. So a shorter fallow. And it didn't rain again. So where we had wheat stubble, or well, chickpea stubble, the fallow was that dry that our chickpea stubble hung around. Um, where we had wheat stubble, got reasonable cover, early, mid and late terminated soil. So I guess one of the learnings for me in that season is our sorghum cover crop ran out of moisture and from mid to late, we used water, but we didn't actually get any more ground cover. Uh, so this is gravimetric soil sampling, not the neutrons, but um, I guess well, to start off with our wheat stubble, our wheat used more water than our chickpea, so we're behind from the start. Um, but again, our cover crops, they used water early, used 60 mils, late, uh, mid a bit more, and that late we held out a long time hoping to get a bit of rain and a bit more cover and it, and it happened that rainfall basically fell the week before we sprayed it out so that's why it looks higher than the mid but it would have been lower and then it's just accumulated back to that point short fallow we had about 70 mils of rainfall from the late termination to when we planted our wheat and again you know it's dry. Where we've had our cover crops, it was dry. Commercially, we wouldn't have done it. But anyway, we did. We trickled it in, ran some trickle tape down the rows to get it out of the ground and then left it to it. Um, yeah, wheat stubble, we've actually accumulated a fair bit more moisture in our wheat stubble than our chickpeas, but just that deficit at the start, the, the bare chickpea stubble was the wettest in this season. Um, So we planned our cover crops and those, where we had the cover crops, there was no moisture on them. So the wheat got up and it did nothing or died. So where we grew the better wheat crops, we extracted more water, which in this scenario was actually the fallows, not the cover crops. So from this season, from this trial, we grew 700 kilos where it had our chickpeas double. So more water left at harvest, plus accumulated a little bit over the fallow. Our wheat stubble, we had four treatments down, four different stubble manipulations down the bottom. It didn't make a difference in that season. It grew about half a tonne to the hectare. And our cover crops, you know, that, that early spray out in that scenario, it didn't look like much and it's not much yield but it's the highest yielding of the cover crops and obviously growing it longer we've shortened the fallow and we've used more had less water at planting so we've um, got less grain yield so we actually kept monitoring those last two sites at Jagerburn and Billabilla um, and we looked at the 2020 wheat crop um, at Jagerburn, where we'd grown a half decent crop, it wasn't a big yield, but it, it gave us good wheat stubble. Um, plant available water and crop yield of the 2020 wheat crop was the same across the, the thing. So we had good wheat stubble from the 2019 crop. So everything was the same the year after. At Billabella, we had um a range from a poor wheat crop to a dead wheat crop so we had stubble differences there and again we got yield differences um unfortunately it was not what we were hoping for but growing that wheat crop has given us what a cover crop would provide us and that's just more ground cover 
where we grew more wheat in 19, we had more plant available water at, in 20 and we grew more yield. Where we had our cover crops, we didn't grow the wheat stubble and we're 18 months after spraying out a cover crop. So that stubble's broken down and blown away and we've had a loss. Um, and then just by chance, I had a PhD student wanted to do a trial on um, measuring carbon in cover crops. So I said, oh, well, let's let's go and have a look at the Mangunya site. And they, they wanted to put a trial down over the top of our old site. We walked into the paddock. It's grown two wheat crops since our cover crop, and you can still see the control plots. So I guess for me, that highlights that, you know, in some respects, a cover crop is hitting the reset button. It's putting our cover back on and then we can go forwards from there. Where we didn't have cover crop at that, uh, where we didn't have cover at that site in 18, 17, 18, we haven't been able to grow the wheat stubble to get the ground cover. So it's just been a bit of a snowball effect. Um, what have I done there? Mm. So the other thing we did as part of this project, and that was my CSIRO friends, not one of my skills, is we did a little bit of modelling. So they plugged the Bungunya trial site into AppSim and said, right, what's going to happen over 100 years of rainfall? And this is the outcome. We've got a heap of dots on the page. So the blue dots are where they've said we've sprayed it out at early termination. Orange dots are at mid termination and the yellow dots are at late termination. And I've got two blue lines on the page there. So in the driest 25% of the years when you've got less than 200 mils of rainfall after the fallow, our early termination has recovered that water um, most of the time, but less, sorry, less than 200 mils, every, all the cover crops have a water deficit and we're looking at cover crops or we're not going to recover the water we use by the cover crop. There are still other reasons that I'll talk about in the next slide. And then you go above when you get in the really wet years above the blue, the other blue line is it's so wet that everything's wet and it actually didn't matter whether you had cover or not. Um, there's enough rainfall there that you've got a lot of water under your, in your bucket, whether you've, got high fallow efficiency or low fallow efficiency. Um, so in that, between those two lines is the range of seasons where cover crops are gonna pay you money. Um, and then the, the termination timing becomes a balancing equation between how much water you use, how long a fallow do you need and how much rainfall you're gonna get in that. So obviously you're, your earlier spray out's going to pay back sooner. Your later spray out's going to take more rainfall to pay back. Now look at that. And I've got all these things summarised down the spot. Um, so I guess that last point's the most critical. You're going to have years when you're going to be worse off. You're going to have years when you're going to be better off. On average, over 100 years of rainfall, we had 17 millimetres more POW at the end of that, um, so more water in the bucket for use for the next crop at the end of that long fallow, coming out of sorghum into wheat. Um, if so, there. Yeah, so that's assuming assuming you roll, you just plant it every year. Um, you'll be 17 mils, which is about 200 kilograms of grain, better off every year. Um, the other thing they looked at, which, so we didn't measure erosion in the trials, but we modelled it. Um, and that was the other big thing. So those blue lines are in the same place as that previous graph. Um, again, those dry years, any cover crop has reduced erosion and eradicated it below in those driest years. Um, so the black dots here are where we've left the paddock bare, and then again, blue is an early sprayed out cover crop. Orange is a mid sprayed out cover crop and yellow is a later sprayed cover crop. Um, you know, we get in that sweet spot where, where our cover crops start to pay back. Um, 
you know, as, as we start getting wetter, our early spray deck cover crops, we're running out of cover in those wetter seasons and we're starting to get a little bit of erosion, but we're still a long way better than if we had done nothing. Um, mid termination, again, it's reducing erosion a lot. Um, And um, you know, now greatest benefit is in these wettest years where from a water point of view, it didn't matter what you did, but when you're protect, trying to protect the greatest asset you own, which is your soil, having that ground cover there has become critical. So then I pose the question, what is the cost of erosion? What does it cost you to build and maintain corner banks, to run around with scrapers to fill in bloody gullies before you can plant your wheat crop this year. Um, so one of the questions Bill asked me to address was, um, you know, how low is low in ground cover? I think I've skirted around that pretty well. So I threw this slide here. Uh, I think this slide, this graph is older than me, but it, it shows that modelled erosion point pretty well. If you got low ground cover, you got high erosion. So, yeah, in the grains industry, we aim for making sure we're above 30% ground cover all the time. Um, you know, if you're if you're in the pastures, you you know they're aiming to be up close to that 70%. It's about soil loss, and you know, 80% of the farm is in the top 10 centimeters of your soil. So, if you can protect that, you're protecting your greatest asset. Um, the other thing I had to play with is I love the Soilwater app or the Climate app. Um, Soilwater app can only be used on Apple devices. Climate is on, uh, it is an app, but you can also use it as web base. And I just grabbed the site. Um, I did, this one's 12 months old. Pick a starting date, doesn't matter and I just ran it at 0% ground cover. Go into the settings, change your ground cover to 100% and you can see real life data and it actually lines up pretty well the real world with um, you know, more ground cover equals more water. And you can see there, it tells you what the fail efficiency is with no cover and cover and you've gone from 18 to 53% in that season. Um, so then I went and took it a step further and thought, well, on average, our cover crops have been about 50 mils drier at when we sprayed them out. So I ran my 0% cover. Then I went and changed my starting water at that fallow, reduced it by 50 mils and ran it again. Same shape line. Um, but this time here, you can see we've used 50 mils to get our cover crop planted and grown and that improved fallow efficiency is built over time and uh, so the date I ran it was the 10th of November so at a, at a point in time you're better off having more ground cover and that's just a, a quick game you can play by yourself and fiddle around with um, cover percentages and you'll get a range of answers and um, satisfy yourself. And I thought this thing I highlighted here was really interesting. So we've actually increased runoff in this scenario by having more ground cover. Um, the most critical thing, but is by having good ground cover is that runoff runs clear, it doesn't run off muddy. So you might be running off, losing water off the top from runoff, but you're saving your topsoil still. So my summary lines here is, Consider your cover crops um, if you have low cover. So all of our trials, we've looked at proper low cover, um, but I think 30% is still a good threshold to start thinking about it. Um, get comfortable at that, and then you can start playing at the higher, you know, we, those higher cover levels. We had a trial we set up where we had zero, 30, 60, 80% ground cover at the start before we planned our cover crops, but that was in 2019 and never rained, so we never got to plant our cover crops. So that was a bugger, but that happens. 
Um, if you've only got a short fallow, then um, early spray out is going to use less water and it's going to hang around long enough. Um, a longer fallow, it'll, it pays to use that bit more water to get that resilient stubble that's going to hang around. Um, and remembering the impact isn't only in the fallow, if you've got more ground cover in any in-crop rainfall you get until canopy closure of your cash crop is going to um, benefit you as well. Um, so again, a bit of crop competition in the fallow. We saved ourselves a couple of fallow sprays. That's worth money. Um, just having that ground cover of planting gives you that better moisture in the seed bed. Get a better planting, better crop establishment. It also gives you more time to get across your country. Um, and in a lot of cases, we've had more water of where we've established a better crop, those crops have actually sucked the bucket a bit harder and, and got more yield again. Um, there's a bit of a repeat there, but uh, optimising how long your cover crop is is a balancing act between how long your fallow is, um, how much water you want to use, how long do you need the stubble to hang around for. Double type is important. Um, if you choose a soft leafy cover crop, it's going to break down quicker. Again, in a short fallow, that doesn't matter. In a longer fallow, it will. Um, we're choosing varieties that are going to get to the growth stage where we can terminate them as quick as possible. So don't go a forage sorghum. It's going to take you 120 days to spray out. Um, if you're going to go sorghum, pick the one that's going to go get to spray out into flowering the quickest. Um, and that's why millet's such a great fit. It gets to flowering really quickly, but it's small seed and hard to establish once it gets hot and dry. Um, again, we get that high fallow efficiency period straight up to spray out. And that last point there is where we miss the spray out on that plot. We, so post anthesis, the plants start using water to produce grain and we're not getting any benefit at all because it's putting it into grain, not into biomass and ground cover. Thank you. And all this research is in that publication on the right hand side and or past and future editions. Okay. Uh, thanks very much for that, Andrew. Um, that's a great piece of research and particularly going to the point of using trickle tape to get your um, plots up that's that's dedication to research if ever I've seen it um, yeah well, I can't take all the credit on that one <laughs> yeah well it's yeah it must have been a lot of work yeah to do that yep. yeah whoever did it um, give them my regards because yeah they certainly <laughs> <laughs> yeah they certainly showed some dedication um, we haven't got any questions so far so i'll just throw one in and if anyone else would like to type something in please feel free to but that apps in modeling seem to indicate to me that over that long run the early termination was your best bet overall because it seemed to have lots of dots above the line and yep. not many dots below the line was my my simple interpretation of that. I I guess as you say, you can adjust your spray out time according to the season, but do you think that's a fair interpretation of that? Um yes it is. The the limitation of AppSim is that it um all the stubbles break down at the same rate. So the in the wetter seasons, that early termination is probably a little bit of an overestimation. So I'd, I'd probably still be leaning towards okay. that mid in a lot of cases um, in, in that scenario. But again, if you're in a, a short fallow, let's say from winter crop to winter crop, then yeah, that's, that's where your early termination is going to fit. Okay, yep. yep. And... Um, Another, it is it fair to say that 
a fair bit of the benefit in cover crops is not in the fallow, but it is in the fallow, but it's also in early crop growth. Yeah, well, and, and that's, the, that's gonna change a little bit depending on where you are and when your rain falls. Yep. So, yeah, if, if you're in an environment where you get a lot of rainfall in that first three months after you plant, then yeah, you're gonna get a lot more benefit in crop. Um, in our environment, that's, you know, most our wettest month of the year is March, which is two months before we plant our wheat. So that's where we're getting our greatest benefit. Okay, yep. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, and would you say that, yeah, probably it's better to not go with multi species and that probably you're best to just stick to millet? which is always seems to have been the go-to cover crop? Um, I wouldn't recommend it and I wouldn't recommend not to do it. So I'm still firmly on okay. the fence for multi-species. They have performed probably on par with their millet. So, but what I would say is if you're going multi-species, make sure you have got enough cereal in that mixture that you're going to get that resilient stubble that's going to get the benefit that we're getting from our pure millet cover crops. Um, I, For me, the the single species cereal cover crops, just they're just so much easier to manage and all of you know, the, the agronomy around them are a lot easier. Um, yeah, so I, I would be starting with cereals first, getting comfortable with them and then and then going down those other lines if that's your inclination. But so those other system benefits that people talk about around cover crops is you're probably going to get that, you know, a bit of nitrogen. Um, you, you know, your brassicas will help with nematodes in some soils um, if you've got the right brassicas. Um, that's they're they're the fits for multi species, but that's not my area of expertise or research, so I won't recommend either way on that. But yeah, for fallow efficiency, you need a resilient stubble, and cereals are going to provide that the best. Okay, and perhaps following on from that, most of the benefit from cover crops is water. Are, are you able to? Are you able to identify any sort of X factor that of benefit that you can't explain by water alone? Or could you quantify that at all? Or uh, well that, that Bangani trial, we got an extra ton and a half. Um, so a ton of that is more than what we can explain with water. So we're speculating, but I I think a lot of it's um, just getting that better crop establishment. And whether what's driving that, we will we can only speculate. But yeah, you know, def, we definitely had more moisture in the seed bed. But at that site, our legging cover crops, we had less water uh, at planting, but we still grew more yield than the bare fallow. Okay then. Well, thanks very much for that. Um, if there's no more questions, we might um, pull it up there. Um, I just remind everybody that there will be a survey following the end of the webinar and uh, the webinar will be available as a recording um, if you if you wish to access it and you can contact LLS about that. Okay, um, if you if you think you're done, Andrew, we might leave it there and yep. Thanks very much for taking us through some great research and uh, thanks to all the people who attended, some 50 odd people. Yep. Okay, everybody, thanks a lot and goodbye for now. All right, thank you.